like Annie is on her way to join us. Hello, Annie. Can you hear me, Annie? I can. Can you hear me okay? I can. That's perfect. Brilliant. Um, so, Annie Griffith is one of the first women photographers um, to work at the National Geographic Society and has been a contributor to um, dozens of editions and publications and magazines and has visited um, hundreds of countries, I think, during her work. So, um, we're going to finish today's seminar with uh, a bit of a walk through some of those those images and some of the stories that Annie has to share. Thank you very much for being with us. And I'll now pass over to you. Great. Well, I welcome everyone. I'm, I'm so glad you've joined us. I um, geographic is for its photography. But it might surprise you to know that um, it began, National Geographic Be Magazine began as a scholarly journal. And when the very first pictures were introduced to the magazine, there was a great outcry, great anger, and, and some people resigned their memberships because they felt that photographs were kind of uh, detracting from the scholarly nature of the journal. But I'm happy to say that many more people felt that they learned more because there were photographs in the magazine. And honestly, if I could ma wave a magic wand, I would deliver the National Geographic magazine to every little school in every corner of the earth because the, the fact that the magazine is picture driven means that even without the benefit of reading and writing or of language, people can learn from the stories that are represented in photographs in the magazine. So I'm going to begin today um, with a, a real learning moment in my life. The very first time National Geographic sent me off to, um, to photograph outside the United States was in the country of Namibia. And you can see here a picture of me at age 25. Um, and here's what I love about the picture. I love that it looks like two girlfriends just talking, just having a conversation. And we were, without the benefit of any language at all, we were able to communicate visually. You know, I would do sign language and I would, um, you know, point to things. And I learned, I learned through that encounter that direct communication with people, even if it's imperfect or even if you're making kind of an idiot out of yourself, is more effective than having an interpreter that I speak to and then that person speaks to the other person and back and forth. That direct human contact is in many ways the very best way uh, to go out into the world. And the camera has really been my passport in these situations and many others. You know, in this situation, uh, the women, the, the Ovahimba women, were able to say to me, through pantomime, they would hold up a breast and point to their mouth, and they were clearly asking me if I had some kind of magic medicine that would help their milk to come in because they'd been living for seven years in drought. I understood what they were asking. We understood each other. They lived in this beautiful, beautiful desert, but can you imagine trying to find lunch for yourself and your family in a, in a drought uh, a drought situation in an already very dry place. So um, I, I learned tremendous admiration for them because they literally, through generations of being taught by their mothers and their mother's mothers, had learned how to survive where none of us would ever be able to survive. They lived side by side with animals. And, um, and what I saw through the way they behaved was that they knew how to use every single cell of an animal. There was no waste at all. And they made clothing and they made tools and they made and they ate and they they really knew how to um, maximize the use of, of any creature that they killed. And that to me was showed a lot of respect and a lot of understanding. So 
Let me take you back to when I started in photography. This is actually a picture I took on the day I decided to become a photographer. And it was just a class assignment about light, but it was one of those days, and I think uh, people who, who are excited about communicating visually have these days. It was just early morning on a golf course in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was fall, and uh, there was a fog, so when the light came through the tree, it fractured into all of these beautiful shapes. And at the time, I was actually laying on a sprinkler on the golf course. And uh, after I shot this picture, it went off. So I was cold and wet and muddy and ecstatically happy. And I realized that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I think that there are a variety of ways that people learn. And for me, communicating visually thrilled me. It, it was just where I was meant to be. And so the very first photographs I took were, of, you know, my own backyard. I, I grew up in Minnesota, and so I worked taking pictures of farming and, um, you know, rural things. And that translated amazingly well to when I began working for National Geographic because this, this is a picture taken from the first story I did for National Geographic, and it too was in my backyard. It was uh, in northern Minnesota, and I really, um, I really understood my own culture. And by working hard to communicate who my own culture is, I was able to, um, to know enough so that when I went out into the wider world, I could shine a light on other cultures. You know, when National Geographic communicates about a place, we really try very hard to give a sense of being there, a sense of what it feels like to live there. It's a, um, you know, it, it, it's a wonderful thing for a photographer because we take pictures of, of nature and wildlife and people and issues. And that's, uh, you know, to me, that's, that's the thrill of, of really bringing home to our readers what a place is like. So this picture, for example, was taken in Minneapolis, where I grew up. And Minneapolis is known for severe, severe cold. And you know, this picture of a bicycle just says it all. Um, you, you feel cold when you look at it. And so often, that's what photographers are looking for. We're trying to, to uh, help people feel something. This is a coyote. And um, again, it's that you know, staying with an animal and moving slowly and learning how to sort of disappear as a photographer so that whether it's a coyote or the human animal, that they, their spirit really comes out into the picture. And what I've learned is that almost anything can be beautiful, that it really is in the eyes of the beholder. And um, so these are just grasses, just prairie grasses. But uh, the day that I was photographing this, the light was beautiful. And I just I thought, you know, th these are the kinds of things we overlook sometimes. We overlook how beautiful something as simple and as abundant as, as a, a field of grass can be. These are white pelicans, um, again, in the United States. And they um, were gathered in a uh, salt marsh uh, down in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And a lot of times, as a photographer, what we want to do is, is find a way to photograph that will make people stop and think, and in many cases, read and learn more about the subject that we're photographing. This, this picture was taken in New Zealand. When I started traveling um, internationally a great deal, and I have worked in over 150 countries, I um, I was so well equipped because of working for National Geographic in the United States first. I really understood storytelling. And so much of storytelling is really um, making people feel like they're there, that they're really there. This was taken from a little uh, rubber raft, and I'm leaning over the side um, in a fjord in, in New Zealand. And you know, you just feel like you're with these dolphins. That's what I'm often going for. This is behind the scenes uh, as, a, as a, a Chinese woman is preparing for the opera. And to me, often, 
the pictures that happen before an event or after an event are the most telling. It's not so much the performance. It's, it's getting close to people. And I think one of the biggest mistakes photographers make is not getting close enough. The truth is what really moves us in most pictures of human beings is either a moment of connection or their face. They're the intensity of who they are. This is a woman in India, and sometimes, you know, you just look and the quality of light is so beautiful that you know it's going to kind of bring that person to life in, in a new way. Oops, it didn't go. Another thing that, that you'll find uh, is, and I think this is so important in teaching, is to teach students not to try to do everything right. That creativity is often comes from the imperfect side of things. So a lot of times I have to photograph something that millions of people have photographed and I have to try to find a new way. And searching for that new way is, you know, it's a joy, it's a hunt. And I think, uh, I know I have a, a two-year-old granddaughter now and I'm trying so hard to help her express things and communicate things the way she sees them, the way she feels them. So this is the Taj Mahal, of course, and um, I, uh, at first I was kind of annoyed that all those other people were at the Taj Mahal when I wanted to photograph it. Um, but then I realized, wait a minute, now I can use the people as elements of the photograph if I simply photograph the, the reflecting pool. And of course we all identify the Taj, but it's a new way of seeing it. Likewise, in Easter Island, you know, uh, it's been photographed so many different ways. And I was, you know, I was there all different times of day trying to look for a, a vision of it that was a little bit different than is usually done. In Turkey, when I was lucky enough to photograph the dervishes, I was so struck by the fact that this was a this was really a uh, meditation, not a dance. I had a, an impression it was a dance. And so what I felt is that I wanted to be as close as I could be, but utterly quiet in hopes that the feeling of the meditation of these men would come through in the photograph. This is in Mexico, and sometimes it's the spirit of a place that doesn't need very much else. I mean, Mexico is so colorful, it's so lively. The Latin culture is, is uh, just so warm. And, and what I love is that often paint is the way that people express their joy. And uh, this was just in a cafe in uh, Mexico. And I, you know, I just loved the play of light and color. And to me, that was all it took to communicate the joy of the place. Likewise, here I was in um, Mexico as well, and this is the, migra the migration of the uh, butterflies. The, the great, uh, great, probably one of the greatest phenomena on Earth, where millions and millions of butterflies go to one location in the world, and of course that makes that location very, very special. So what we're trying to communicate in this story is how important it is to, to save that precious forest in Mexico, or all those butterflies will die. There are other times when the only way you can really show something dramatically is from above. So this is an aerial photograph, and National Geographic allows us to, to photograph from above in situations where it's really going to bring the, the information to the reader. And, and this is all that is left of Colorado River Delta when it finally reaches the Sea of Cortez. And the message, the important part of this photograph is that it's evidence that all of the water from that river is siphoned off for human use, not allowing it ever to reach its natural end at um, the uh, Sea of Cortez. Sorry, I have to quiet somebody down a little bit here. Here, um, 
here's an example of a portrait. And I think what's so important is to be with people long enough that you can know their personality a little bit. And this woman was so dignified. She's standing in her kitchen, and she was actually holding her niece, her, her baby niece, and she asked me to take her picture. But by using the light and using the way you interact with people, you can really show their dignity and their, um, you know, or their humor or their wit. So I'll talk a lot today about photographing people. This is one of my favorite photographs. And the reason I love it is because I learned from it. I learn every day in my job. This man is standing at the top of Victoria Falls in Zambia. And it was a day where I uh, was so um, disappointed when I arrived in Zambia because Victoria Falls is this mighty falls and it's, it's, it's just roars. And the day that I came in, uh, the river was running very gently and the falls was not that impressive. I mean, it's still a huge falls. But in talking to the locals, I found out that there was a swimming hole at the top of the falls that only was only accessible during a few days in the year when the river ran this quietly. And so we, we went out there. It was also accessible because the crocodiles and the hippopotamus that live in the river won't go this close to the edge. So we didn't get eaten on our way out there. But it ended up being, to me, a so much more uh, powerful image showing um, this man in one of the most beautiful places on earth having just a quiet, private moment. In Argentina, I got to work with gauchos, and, and I wanted to really get a sense of how gentle they were with their animals. In uh, Peru, Machu Picchu has been photographed and photographed and photographed, and I spent about an hour inching my way closer and closer to this llama um, so that I wouldn't frighten him, but that I could get him in this picture with this extraordinary scene behind him. So sometimes it takes a lot of patience, and I think, um, and I think it's, it's certainly worth it. You earn the picture by being patient and thoughtful and really looking for a way to um, put something in context. In China, you know, sometimes a very, very simple picture tells it all. It's just the, this amazing little face. I've, I've worked a lot in Britain, and I have kind of a crush on British men. So this is, a, this is actually a British farmer, um, and on his back is his 11th child, and the picture was taken the day his 12th child came home from the hospital. But what I like about this portrait is you can sort of see his life written on his face, you can see the harshness of the land he lives on. And you can see, of course, that he's a father. So communicating who someone is in a photograph is something that we strive for. This is another British group. <laughs> and you know, when I'm, because the camera is my passport, when I go into situations, I'm always asking questions and trying to learn more and more. And I literally was reading the sign on a, in a cafe in northern England, somebody had handwritten a little note on the bulletin board about the Calder Valley Mouse Club. And so I went, and sure enough, this is British character. These men literally raise mice and show them competitively. And, you know, <laughs> and here, likewise, more British men. And here I'm trying to show the, sort of the vitality um, and the, um, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, We'll try to fix this little guy. Um, the vitality and the, and the humor of Australian men. And uh, they had dressed their boat up as Swan Lake for this boat parade. But after they'd been out on the water for a while, they their inner ballerina came out. And I looked over, and their ankles were crossed, and their toes were, were curled. And I just thought, you know, you can't even make this stuff up. I've also worked a great deal in the Middle East, and I found um, it, one of the most lovely periods of my family's life is that we worked for about five years on and off in the Middle East in places like Petra. You know, we tra I traveled by camel and worked with uh, the Bedouin police. This is the kind of landscape we were traveling for, through, beautiful, beautiful Wadi Rum.
And um, I remember when I went out with these three guys, the first thing they said to me is, we will treat you like we would treat our mother. And they did. And these are my three guys. And they, you know, they had a very serious job to do, but they provided for me. And, you know, they gave me the nicest camel and the first cup of tea and the nicest blanket. And it was wonderful. But my favorite thing working in the Middle East was working with Middle Eastern women. And, um, you know, people will say to all of us, I think, um, you know, aren't you scared or isn't it a disadvantage to be a woman? And the truth is, I think it's like everything else. Sometimes it's an advantage to be tall. Sometimes it's an advantage to be short. The, the fact that I'm a woman means that I am able to spend time with the female side of some societies where the men cannot go. And I see that as an enormous privilege. This was a wonderful day where I went to a Drew's wedding and I didn't know anything about Drew's wedding. So I asked lots of questions. And this is something I think all teachers encourage their students to do. Ask, ask, ask. Keep that curiosity up. So I found out that, the, that when the bride was gathered with all the girls at her parents' house, um, the groom would be with all the guys at his parents' house. And then they would come and play music, and they'd come to get her for the wedding. And as soon as she heard the, the men coming, she had to cry hysterically to honor her family and show that she did not want to leave her parents. And so this, someone told me this, and I was prepared. And you can see she's giving the performance of her life. And Grandma's laughing because she's pleased. And it, you know, it's just one of those cultural moments that comes only if you ask questions. Other, other things require tons and tons of, of pushing and, and begging and, and asking for permission. And this was one of those situations where I really wanted to show the beauty at the end of Ramadan when the women gather inside the, the Dome of the Rock for the, the sunrise and the final breaking of the fast. And everyone told me no, and everyone told me no. Um, so, but in the end, there was a woman who I met uh, whose husband was very high ranking and I spent time with her and she is the one who actually got me in inside the Dome of the Rock. Um, once you're in, you know, you, you have this exquisite opportunity just to be with people at an important point in their lives. And so I think the ultimate thing we try to communicate with photographs is the humanity of each person. And this lady was just one of my favorite Bedouin women, tough as nails and sweet as pie. I do work uh, often for aid organizations. And I did a series of, of images for Habitat of, for Humanity trying to show what it feels like to be given shelter, to be given the dignity of a home. And it was such a joyful, um, a joyful project to do. This is in Brazil and a whole community of, of families who received homes. And this is a, a Habitat volunteer who had worked with this family to get them a car. <laughs> that, um, you know, that part of, of my work, really shining a light on, on things that are helpful, um, has become very important to me. And so I call it making my pictures useful as well as beautiful. And this is a woman in Rwanda with her two children, just sitting inside her hut with window light. And here you can see by body language and by getting close to people, their spirit is, re is revealed. And that's what I'm really searching for when I photograph people. And I think, you know, I hope that as you see these pictures, you're having an emotional reaction. That's what visual content does. It makes you feel something. This was in Haiti. Now, this is in a refugee camp uh, in Burma, but you can see this is a happy place. This is a, you know, uh, a place where people are safe and happy. And I like to communicate that through the kinds of pictures I take. This is a refugee camp in Kenya, and the very opposite was the truth. The people were suffering tremendously. It was a, it was a horrible place. And um, by photographing the same subject, 
but telling a different reality uh, is how you really help people understand what's happening on the ground. Again, can you see how close I am to people? That's really the key, I think, with working with people, is, is to physically be close to them. I think a lot of times uh, people travel and they put on a telephoto lens and they shoot somebody from across the street. And you know, I think it's so important to tell our students and to tell ourselves that when you travel to a new place, you really want to spend time with people. You really want that encounter to be um, something that you will never forget and that they will never forget. This is a, a picture series on the importance of clean water. And this is in Rwanda. And these, this is how women traditionally get their water. In Cambodia, this is the reaction of the kids when they see water come out of the ground, clean, beautiful water come out of the ground for the first time. And what I like about this is this is the exact same reaction my kids would have if a water spout went off. So I try to show our commonality, our, our common humanity. And here are women in Kenya who are hauling water from a reservoir that was created for them because of the terrible, terrible drought. And then what happens? This is that woman's daughter. And so the kids are able to go to school rather than spend time hauling water. So there are so many ways to tell a little story. Education is something that I focus on a lot um, in my work. I really I see this thirst for knowledge all over the world. This is in Bolivia. And this is in Rwanda. And you can just see the energy, the, how much kids want to get an education. And you can see very different ways of taking pictures of kids at school. This is a, a, a program teaching women how to take better care of their children. And you can see the intensity here, too, learning hygiene. And sometimes you can put the stories together. Like in this case, um, I was photographing a wonderful program that teaches women how to be solar technicians. So this woman is taking her final exam. They give her a broken solar lantern, and she sees if she can fix it. And when she passes her exam, she goes back to her village with 50 solar lanterns and gives them to all her girlfriends who've never had light in their lives. And here's the girlfriends. So sometimes with just a few pictures, you can really, um, you know, you can really tell a whole story. In India, um, wonderful cooperative. Now, I tried to tell the story of what happens when women farmers work together. So a farmer brings in her her grain, and then uh, the other women help her sort it and grade it. Then here's the farmer on the right, and she's seeing how much it weighs and what the quality is. And then meanwhile, out back, it's the commodities broker. So it's a woman on a cell phone calling down to see what the going rate for the market is and to uh, put a good price on their product. And then she comes back inside, and hooray, she sold it all. So even with still images, you really can tell um, wonderful stories. I'm going to finish in Pakistan, where um, where I, I had a wonderful encounter that I get to have a lot. I'm, I'm so blessed in the fact that I can go to all these places. And because I'm a photographer, I can just literally spend time with people. So this was in a remote part of Pakistan in the desert. and. Uh, we were so remote that I knew we could never get back to any kind of accommodation that night and that we'd be sleeping in the desert. But the people from this little village took us in and, um, and asked us if we would like to stay with them. And uh, we, we said yes. I'm having a hard time getting this. Thing. There we go. <laughs> this is the little village. Anyway, they, they asked if we would stay in their village that night, and we gratefully accepted. And with that, they, they hauled out their best little cots and their best blankets and they set us up in middle, you know, the middle of the little tiny, tiny village and fed us soup. Uh, and as it got dark, they asked if we would like music. And we said, oh, we love music. And with that, uh, five or six elderly men with handmade instruments came and made a semicircle around our cots and literally played until we fell asleep. And I promise you, these people have never heard of National Geographic. But what I've learned from, from these encounters is that people who have nothing 
give everything. And um, and telling their stories, it, you know, has just been the greatest privilege of my life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie. Those are just stunning photos and so inspiring and I think um, it's going to make us all go away from this conference looking at things very differently um, all the time. Um, so we've come to the end of our conference uh, now. Hello? Okay. Um, we almost got all the way through the conference without any uh, technical glitches.